you know, the Sayers family were, were literally provoked into, you know, coming out and saying something by, by Paddy Conroy. You know, Paddy Conroy um, was never really a rival. Um, in fact, he was, you know, a friend of the family at one point. But mm. he just, be, you know, he took an opportunity to go on national television and, and call the Sayers family police informers and grasses. Be a snake in the grass and, and unfortunately, unfortunately for him, um, you know, he came up against, you know, somebody in Stephen Sayers who thought, well, actually, I'm going to put the record straight here because an unwritten lie or an unspoken lie becomes a truth. Yeah. And that, that provoked Stephen into actually think, well, I better put my side of the story out here. And I'd approached Stephen a couple of years earlier and asked him to do the book and he went, no way, we'll never do anything like that. Uh, but, you know, because of the McIntyre documentary with Paddy Conroy, that was what, you know, that was basically what stung the hornet, you know, mm. the, you know poked the hornet's nest. And you got to have your saying. Everyone yeah. knows the true story, what know him, but the people who mm -hmm. don't know him, mm -hmm. it, you throw enough mud, mud sticks. And that was it. I mean, for me, you know, it was it was a delight to hear C Stephen C wanted to do the book. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, he, he had his he had his reasons for doing it. And I could understand that. And I'm not taking sides in the situation. I'm just somebody who's there to, to help Stephen convey the message through the book, which is what we've done with, with other books, you know. But Stephen wanted to get the message across. And what we found with Stephen is over the last three years, he's become he's become media savvy. He, he understands how it works. And, you know, I think that's an important thing. Whereas in the past, there's always been this deafening silence from anyone on Tyneside yeah. nobody on Tyneside would ever speak the Geordie Mafia was a thing of myth and nobody really understood it but you know over the course of the last few years again working with Neil Jackson we've gone out and we've interviewed various figures you know whether it's Dennis Stafford and Michael Lavaglio um, about the one-armed bandit murder or whether it's uh, John Mario Cummins who's you know Cunningham who's now dead sadly um, you know or, or Machine Gun Kelly or uh, Kenny Pander Anderson. We've, we've met and interviewed all of these people over the last few years and we've opened up people's eyes to, to actually, there was an underworld in Newcastle and this is what it's all about, you know, and it's been fascinating for people. And for me, yes, we can make some money out of it, but it's also social history. It's something which is just as important as, you know, the Stevenson Rocket or yeah. Hadrian's Wall in our part of uh, the world because it's something that people have, Ultimately, they've grown up with, but maybe have, have been completely unaware of, you know, and, and the, the villain's history is just as important. I never heard of there's so many villains, uh, the villains, what you just mentioned then. Mm -hmm. I always, like, being from, like, doing Simon Atkinson, I always knew Viv Graham, um, the young lad that got killed. Lee Duffy, yeah. Lee Duffy, and the big guy. Brian Cockrell, yeah. Yeah, I think the hard men stories are obviously things that are going to circulate around prisons. You know, people yeah, who yeah. people people who can handle themselves and who can who can knock themselves out, and obviously people who've hit a, an untimely end. You know, the Lee Duffy story is renowned. You know, in Middlesbrough, which is obviously like you know it's an hour's drive from Newcastle, but he was very good friends with the Sayers. He used to come and socialise with Stephen and Respected. Michael in particular, um, and of course Viv Graham, who Stephen obviously served time with um, for the Hobos nightclub um, assault on on Stu Watson, the doorman. Um, you know, which again is, you know, it's a piece of gangland history in, in, in yeah. Tyneside. But, you know, Viv obviously met a, an untimely end. He was shot dead. Lee Duffy was stabbed to death. Um, so those people will always be be renowned. Brian Cockrell, of course, is the, you know, the person who essentially... Resurrection. Resurrection, yeah. And he's a <laughs> lovely guy. He's a lovely, he's, he is a lovely guy. I mean, he, he went on, of course, on the McIntyre documentary as well. Yeah. And he had national recognition on there. And, you know, but he's found God now. He's, he's you know, he's campaigning against, you know, knife crime, which is great. He's going into schools. And, and him and Stephen Sears are now going to do their first two stage shows in April together. That'll be um, brilliant. I'm going to interview the two of them. And uh, looking forward to doing those two nights. One in Blythe, um, one in Bishop Auckland, sorry, and one in Newcastle. So, you mentioned social history. Then, how much do you think the Charles Bronson movie distorted social history? It was very like a Clockwork Orange. Um, mm. That's what the Bronson film was like. I think with films, you're always going to struggle um, to please everybody. Career films will always be. I'll always be critical of them because I'm, you know, I would I would say that I'm an expert on the crazy side of things. I've, you know, I visited Reggie for ten years, visited Ron for five, and obviously have a have a you know a big collection on them, and you know read every book and 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 contributed to numerous television programs over the years about the crazy. So, for me, Bronson is is similar. You know, it, it's it's. It's one film. Tom Hardy got a, you know, it was Tom Hardy's big break. It, it helped launch Tom Hardy's career. He'd had a lot of smaller parts in films. This was his first lead role. Um, look, 
it, it's a film. It's it's an entertainment. It's there for people to enjoy. I know Charlie was pleased with the interpretation um, and, and the way it came across, but it was written in a particular way. In, and as I said, it was very like a, a you know a clockwork orange. It was you know filmed in that particular way. It, it, it almost. It, it accentuates the madness, you know what I mean? It's, you know, Charlie's been in, you know, you know, Broadmoor and injected with God knows what over the years and mm. been in Rampton, been in, you know, injected with God knows what and they're beaten, come across, you know, so many weird characters that the madness, I think, had to, to come out. And, you know, it's a film. I enjoyed it as a film. Um, I haven't watched it. Like again. black comedy and it like... Yeah. One flew over the cuckoo's nest. Exactly the same. Like exactly the same. It, it, it's got to accentuate the madness because yeah. I don't think people would understand it if you just had Charlie in there and, and if they'd filmed it like, you know, McVicker, which is a great film, Roger yes. Daltrey, yeah. if they'd filmed it like that and just had him, you know, carrying out that robbery that he did and then going yeah. inside and beating a load of screws up, I just don't think people would have found yeah. it as in, 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 interesting. It, 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 was a, it was a good film for, for what the subject matter was about, you know. Scum, another one. Yeah, Scum, Scum again is a, is, a, is a great film. It's it's it's, it's lasted it's old school, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's lasted the course of time. It's, yeah. it's an old school film, you know. And obviously, my friend Ray Burdis is in that as well. He plays a good part in that. Um, but yeah, you've got you know you you're going back to films again. But Legend, I didn't I didn't particularly enjoy that. I mean, that originally was supposed to be Freddie Foreman's life story, but the the deal collapsed around Fred and the actor. They had to go and look for another angle, so they, they decided to do a craze film again. They got Tom Hardy on board, of course. Is that play. the one that played both? Is it both yeah, 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 characters? yeah. I thought, to be honest, I mean, we were lucky enough, myself, Christian, who's Fred's godson, and Fred were invited by Tom Hardy to the premiere, so we went to the premiere. Yeah. I've got to be honest, he nailed Reg. I thought he did a fantastic job of Reg. I met Ron. Um, I've got to be honest. I, I thought he, he had to, he's an actor. He picked his own interpretation. Um, it was very over the top and very you know very dramatic and you know it was funny. It was like a comical character. Yeah. I think Ron should have been a lot more quieter and you know sedate. I mean, Ron was essentially you know he was he was mentally ill. He, he was a paranoid schizophrenic, something which wasn't easily diagnosed in those days. He you know he was on stematol from an early age. And you know that you know with stematol you were never supposed to mix it with alcohol or any other drugs. And I think they you know, injected comedy into it. Where yeah. the, the, you don't, you don't. It's not necessarily a comedy movie, is it? No, you know what I mean, Ron was very quietly. They were both very quietly spoken. I mean, yeah. there's not a great deal out there of them. But if you if you go on to go on to YouTube, the interview on the BBC, that's how Ron was still speaking, even in Broadmoor days. Very quiet. And, mm -hmm. Oh, thanks, Ronnie. Cry. How are you? And, and it was like that was it. It was there was yeah. no loud brashness. You would never see. And I've heard this from Charlie. I've heard it from Fred. You never saw him. You would hear him. You would he would lose his temper with Reg. He'd have screaming rows with Reg. But he would never. He would never be openly, you know, gay. He would never talk about his sexuality in front of people. He was never. He was never that over the top with his gayness, you know. Yeah, they made it over flamboyant. Yeah, over flamboyant, and, and you know that's down to the director and it's down to the characterisation. But as I say, getting back to the way he played Reg, I thought he nailed Reg, and yeah. Reg was still very like that in in prison. I mean, he had deaf, he always had a deaf side, Reg. So I always used to laugh and go down on various visits with him. If he got put on one side, I knew he didn't want to speak to that person because he couldn't hear in his left ear, you know. Oh right, yeah. Gay on the gay on the right side. That was the person he wanted to speak to, you know. But he was like a celebrity in prison, you know. Yeah. He would, he would you know, you go into Maidstone, Nottingham in particular, where he had the run of the place and, you know, he'd have tables pulled together, he'd have 12 people sitting round and absolutely mental. But then he would go off, you know, you'd go on a visit to see him and he'd be walking across to the far end and speaking to somebody with, you know, the, down there. and over. You'd spend half an hour waiting for him to come back, you know. He'd, he'd, he'd have like, the run of the mill. Like a celebrity, like a celebrity. Yeah, yeah, like a celebrity. But yeah. A lot of celebrities, is like, they love him, don't they? Like Barbara yeah. Windsor. and I mean, there's a whole list of them. Yeah. Well, I've got nothing mm. but good things to say about the craze. Well, like you're saying with the Bronson film, you know, the interpretation, like, at least Charlie was happy with it. But, yeah. you, know, I, you know, it's down to personal taste whether you, whether you enjoyed that or not. You know, there's, some of these these lower, lower budget Cray films are, you know, they're not really worth watching, you know. So we've gone over to the craze then. How does your relationship with the craze come about? Really through school, I passed an English exam at school studying professional violence by John Pearson. Uh, my English teacher, Peter Yates, came in um, in third year. I was I was on course to fail everything at school. As I said, my mum and dad had put us into private school uh, because I couldn't read or write in the first two years of junior school. And it did pull us back on track, but not, not in the right areas and I was on course to fail everything until that English teacher came in and then I was doing the first year GCSE so he allowed me to study professional violence as part of the curriculum um, I was allowed to pick two books 
So I picked that and I picked uh, Day of the Triffids by John Wyndham. Um, I was also studying The Crucible by Arthur Miller and Brave New World by Aldous Huxley so, um, and Macbeth for Shakespeare. So That's studying, deep for 13 year old. Uh, well, I was studying all these books. I was 15 at this point. Right. So this is the, like I was like a, literally a last minute last minute edition was the was the, this professional violence Still pretty book. deep though. Very are, like, yeah, definitely. I I mean a lot of a lot of different it's things about for there. Fox fucking sport. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote to the careers afterwards and just said look, you know, I wrote to Reggie first and said I passed my English exam studying the life story and I just wanted to say although you've had a you know you know you've ended up in prison and you know you, you committed those crimes I've passed my English exam studying a book about your life and I wrote the same letter to Ron and within a couple of days I had letters back and and a, a pen pal relationship had started up you know um, I contacted a young lad who I'd seen in Take a Break magazine Brad Lane who was Reggie's adopted son who you know, basically had a lot of career memorabilia that Reg had allowed him to keep. He had the wedding photos that had Francis's engagement ring. And they lived in Doncaster. And I ended up going down to visit them uh, a few months later. And basically Reg rang that day while I was there. And I spoke to Reggie Cray on the phone. And he went, you, you must be Steve from Newcastle. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And we had a little chat. And we talked football, actually. I remember him mentioning I'm a Newcastle fan. He's an Arsenal fan. And, you know, he says, uh, do you go to the games? And you'll have to come and see us. And, and that, was where the, that was where the relationship started. And a couple of weeks later, I was on my way to Gartree Prison to meet him. Wow. Um, and that, that was a bizarre, a bizarre journey for me. I got off a, I got a train from Newcastle to Doncaster, which is where Brad and Kim lived. Kim was Brad's mother. And we drove down to Gartree from there. And, uh, you know, foreboding for me to go into a prison, never been to one before. I uh, just remember going in and, you know, having to, to sign in and security and show me ID and then going through being searched and the sniffer dogs and then walk through these huge gates and, you know, then walking into this huge visiting area, which was, you know, we were, we were late on the visit, going into the middle of the room, which is where Reg and Ron always used to like to sit respectively in their, in their, in their different uh, places, Broadmoor and Gartry at the time. And just the noise, it was just like a canteen, you know, and prisoners getting visits up, their family, kids running around. And then just Reg appearing from the far end of the room through the door, you know, obviously from the cells, uh, walking up to us. And, you know, he was in a regulation blue and white striped prison shirt, pair of jeans, big crucifix around his neck, a uh, pair of high-tech trainers. And, uh, you know, just physically strong. He just just won the, um, just lifted the most bench um, in Gartry he'd just broken the record again oh. in Bart uh, Gartry he was 56, 57 at the mm. time when I met him so he was physically strong and vice like grip and it was just great I mean just a good visit he, he was you could see straight away that he was, you know, constantly thinking about business ideas. He pulled out a load of paper from his pocket and put it on the table and there's loads of scrunched up paper and he's opening them all up and there's loads of ideas that he had for Kim, what he wanted her to do and you need to ring this person. Can you send a cheque to that person? Can you do this? Have you, have you given them a book? Have they got a calendar? Have you spoke to Ron? And it was just his mind was 20 to the dozen on that visit. A little bit of time for me. Um... And just saying, he thought that I would be good for Brad because, you know, at the time I was coming up to like 16 and, you know, he was, he, Brad was, I think Brad was 11 at that point. He said, that could be a good influence on Brad. And it was bizarre because I, at one point he was wanting us to move down there, you know, give up, <laughs> move away from his family at 16 and go and move in with Brad and Kim in Doncaster, you know, so I could be like a big brother to him. But it was, it was just, you know, it was a bit surreal, but... The last thing he said before I left on that first visit was that I had to go and see Ron, you know. Um, so two weeks later, I was on my way down to Doncaster again to then travel from Doncaster to uh, to Crowthorne in Berkshire to go to Broadmoor to visit Ronnie Cray. How does that feel as a teenager? You've read about these guys and now you're in a prison with him. Didn't that just blow uh, your mind? You know what? I never really give it a, an opportunity to blow my mind. It just went with the flow. Um, I've met, I'd read about these people. I'd passed my English exam about them. I'd written to them for a reason um, because I wanted but to... You never expected to actually go and see him in nah, prison, would you, from that? Never. Six months later, I You'd be me. lucky to get a letter back. You'd yeah. be happy with that, wouldn't you, and quite content? I mean, I became obsessed with them then. You know, I think I think, I think, think it's a thing that a lot of blokes do. We all have an obsession. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Whatever it is, it could be football, it could be, you know, it's usually sport, rugby or whatever, or it could be, you know, it could be, you know, um, 
like mine was at the time. Peter Beardsley, Chris Waddle, and Kevin Keegan on the wall. We did my room, don't the you? The jam, the jam. Paul Weller in the jam. Morrissey on my wall, and I started putting the craze on my wall. Yeah, I had a photograph of the craze on my wall, and then I had my letters, and I had then I had the first couple of books that I'd bought. So then I'm, all, I'm on my way to visit them, so it becomes an interest. And, and I, I remember going into Broadmoor, and it was my mum had warned us because my mum worked in mental health. She'd been into places like that, and she said it'll be a lot different. You might see things that you know might be a little bit a bit unnerving or frightening, you know. Um, it wasn't frightening it was just but she built it up to be something where I'm thinking you know I, I, I am going to be a bit more cautious but it was a lot more relaxed we got in big Victorian building went through the reception you know same same kind of situation but as as we're walking through Broadmoor you're walking through the you're actually walking through the ward uh, Henley Ward which is what Ron was on to get to this big like open room where there's a stage at one end where they put the Broadmoor productions on so you, you know they get up the, in, the, the the patients as they're called get up and do performances yeah. those who are inclined um, but there's just you know a little canteen at the far end and then just tables and chairs nice conservatory at the back with the doors open leaning into the gardens if you want so to go in the gardens prisons, then, no. no it's a hospital so, the so, so then Ron comes in dressed in a suit, you know, and he was, he walked in late, late, like Reg had been, yeah. uh, we're sitting in the middle of the room again and he walks in and he had a, 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 a pretty, you know, smart suit on from Savile Row, white crisp shirt, still with the RK emblem. Like Very there. nice. Nice, nice silk tie on with a tie pin in. Pinky ring, which is worth about two grand. Pair of Gucci shoes on. Uh, horn, gold horn rim glasses. Walks in like that. Sits at the table. And he's the mental one. And I shake, <laughs> shaking hands, shaking hands with me. Shakes hands with me and shake hands with Kim and you know gives gives Brad a, a cuddle and then sits down and then just clicks his fingers and straight away the nurse comes over. Yes, Ron, what can I get you? And he just, do you want anything to eat? Do you want a drink? And you know, and then he just ordered he ordered um, a can of Calibre non-alcoholic lager and he and a and a packet of twenty cigarettes. And that was it. And basically, that was what he used to do on every visit. You know, he, he'd hold court. He'd chain smoke his way through about 40 John players. He yeah. would never smoke the full cigarette. And if you read the craze books, when he used to go socially, he always used to like have a load of smoke around him. So that's what he was doing in Broadway. He's sitting in the centre of the room, holding court, chain smoking the cigarette, blowing it out, smoke all over the place. And just drinking non-alcoholic calabalaga, <laughs> but he was he was humorous. He was he he was really interested in what we were up to, and you know I, I was naive in those days. You know he he was very he was very quietly spoken, but at the end of the very first visit, he he, he leaned in and he goes, "You don't mind that I'm bisexual, Steve, do you?" <laughs> and I went. I says, not really, Ron. I says, it's not, not for me. I says, but I says, whatever you get up to and whatever I get up to, two completely different things. He's going, good, good. And that was it, you know. But he'd also talked about this infamous cruise now when he, he just said, you know, on the I'd, again, completely naive. He says, I'd love to take love to take you on a cruise when I get out, Steve, you know, you you and a couple of other, other friends of mine. And uh, would you like to go on a cruise? And I was going, well, yeah, it'd be great. So a couple of days later after the visit, um, my mum shouts up the stairs. She goes, uh, Steve, some post for you. And you know, come down the stairs, and it's this huge envelope. She went, "Don't know who this is. It's messy writing, of course. It's Ronnie's like renowned scroll." So I open the envelope and pull it out, and there it is: European cruises, <laughs> a full brochure, and then a little letter in from uh, a little letter in from Ron saying, "Looking, looking forward to the cruise." To let us know where you want to go and it was just like oh, I've still got it to this day um, was... a few years later obviously when he passed away in 95 I, you know my wreath was a I, it was a cruise ship I, oh, I actually lovely. you know it, it, it because obviously I'd grown older yeah I realised what on earth he was going on about I mean you know it, it's one of them things when you're not that way inclined you're not even thinking about that but that was obviously what Ron you know, Ron, <laughs> Ron obviously had you know obviously had an eye for, for me at the time and I hadn't really seen that you know 